Hello everybody and thank you so much for joining me today. Welcome, welcome. So today we are going to be doing a live lecture and that topic is timelines, ETs or interdimensionals, and humanity. So pretty juicy stuff. And if you're new here, because I noticed we have um, some new members, hello. Uh, how this goes is that I'm gonna lecture here for probably about, I would say, two hours or so. And while I'm lecturing, feel free to ask any questions that come up as I go uh, underneath in the question section. And what will happen is that Wolf will take that question He'll send it to me, and then at the very end of the lecture, I'm going to dive into your questions, and we'll have like a little Q&A afterwards. So the only thing that I ask is to keep your questions on topic, so anything about timelines, um, time, and sort of the earth and human development, um, interdimensionals, uh, that kind of thing. So if you could really zero in on those questions, that would be great. And the other thing that makes this a, a little bit different than our normal Q and A's is that at the end, I won't be doing shout outs. Um, I won't be saying any names. So, you know, I, I do that in order to protect, you, you know, your guys's identity that I don't want to be saying your name on YouTube um, because this lecture will also appear on YouTube um, probably later in the week. So it's not an exclusive lecture. The exclusive aspect is, is that we get to hang out and um, do a Q&A afterwards and, and uh, yeah, so no names. <laughs> okay. So um, we are really experiencing a, a shift in our consciousness. And what's happening is we are developing something called our, con our cosmic consciousness. And I think one of the ways this is coming forward is we see, you know, in the spiritual community, suddenly in the last five years, especially, we see this move towards calling people star seeds and, and we see interdimensionals or aliens or ETs kind of coming into the scene and really replacing what would have been 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. It would have been spirits or it would have been um, deceased relatives, or it would have been um, masters or kind of different fairies or different kind of spiritual beings that weren't quite defined as alien. But now we're moving forward and our cosmic consciousness is actually opening, which is a real um, type of consciousness that a human being has. And suddenly we're beginning to see aliens and people are beginning to remember lives in other worlds with strange looking, you know, skin colors and uh, the worlds look very different and these beings are coming forward and they're very different and people are suddenly remembering all of these different abductions and it's kind of like this whole world, this whole cosmic world is really opening up in front of us and um, we're trying to, to figure out what that is and what that means. In ufology and now even politics, we're seeing the, the UFO file moving more and more into the mainstream. We have shows like Ancient Aliens. We have, you know, various different entertainment programs. Um, we have Gaia. Um, we have very different, you know, these different kind of entertainment places that are picking up on the trend and pushing information out there as well. That's really about consciousness and spirituality and ETs. And so this is where things are going. And it is, it is a natural transformation for us to begin to move in this way. We're supposed to be, we're supposed to open our cosmic consciousness at this time. So, um, and that's why we're seeing it all around us. But in order to really be able to use our cosmic consciousness properly, in, in order to be able to perceive these realms and understand these entities that are coming forward and even the political stuff um, that, 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 that comes our way, we really have to understand that, you know, because we're making this jump in consciousness, we really do have to redefine um, 
we, we really have to redefine what the cosmos is and our connection to it. Um, we have to overcome the materialist impulse to view everything as separate. That's the main thing. Other beings as separate, the earth as separate and each other as separate. That's a really big thing, but it's, it's easier said than done. So in this lecture, we're really going to explore um, what that looks like. And more than anything, we need to under, we need to expand our idea of dimensions and density and the cosmos and higher worlds to a very precise cosmic system of initiation. Now, this is not new. We are regaining this. This is something that we knew in Atlantis. This this is knowledge that we've had that we have within us that we have forgotten. So none of this is new information. This is a remembrance of of a multidimensional cosmos, a remembrance of the solar system as really a school of development. And this is the only way we're going to understand the phenomenon that we're going to see in the next decade in the news and in the world. We have to have this spiritual background to understand it. If we don't, we're going to view it in the wrong way. We're going to view it from a materialist perspective, and that will be a missed opportunity to grow. Okay? So one thing that we need to be able to do, um, whether you're a psychic or whether you're, you're not, is to be able to recognize an alien an alien or interdimensional being, and not just see that as an individual being, but to be able to discern what exact timeline is that being from? What relationship does that being have to humanity or to myself, to the earth? And what is their unique and specific evolutionary path? So this is not what we do today in, in esoterica. This is not what we do today in the spiritual scene. We do not interact with interdimensionals that way at all. So how do we tend to react in the spiritual community to different ETs and, and uh, this phenomenon? Well, what we normally do is we make contact with an interdimensional being, an alien. I'm going to use those two phrases uh, interchange interchangeably because I have to use language that people understand. So I'm going to use those those two words interchangeably here. So what happens is we'll make contact with this this interdimensional being, and then we're more like children, where we judge that interdimensional being, or try to understand that interdimensional being based on the information that it shares and whether or not we like that information or whether or not we resonate with that information. So for example, um, we will see like a channeler will come forward and say, I am channeling an Andromedan, I am channeling a Sasani, I am channeling a Grey, I am channeling a Pleiadian or whatever type of interdimensional being that is. And people will often uh, not really qualify that very much and then just listen with an open heart and open ears and not really discern for themselves using their own abilities, using their own power. They will not discern what exact evolutionary path is that being on, that that race of beings or that 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 timeline of beings, what are they on? What is their exact connection to the earth? Why exactly are they here? Um, we're not really, really doing that. We're almost using these interdimensional beings the way that we would in sort of the Eastern mysteries technique where we sit at the feet of a guru. Okay, so we're kind of applying this very old way of learning and being to a phenomenon that is requiring something else from us, okay? So we tend to view these ETs as automatic gurus because when they speak through different channels or different people channel them, the information is farther ahead than perhaps we are. And because it's farther ahead than we personally are in our lives, we automatically assume that that being has the right to teach or that that being is working in our best interest. And as many of you know that are members of this community, um, that is a very dangerous 
thing to assume because beings can be very wise in certain areas of knowledge and then be completely lacking in other areas of development like emotion or compassion or empathy or things like that. But they can have a great deal of knowledge. So it presents a lot of danger when we view things this way and when we don't ask a ton of questions and when we're not we're not wondering, you know, what is the actual timeline that this being is from? What is their evolutionary journey? Where are they in their personal evolution relative to us? What is their connection to the earth? Why exactly are they here? And then but when we do this, we, we get more answers that than to questions about the universe than we could possibly, you know, think to ask. Another way that we tend to interact with um, the idea of extraterrestrials is through shows like maybe Ancient Aliens or um, the premise that extraterrestrials are our parents. So they seeded us, they created us, and that we are fundamentally these ET's parents. And this is also a very dangerous this is also a very dangerous perspective because it actually removes the process of human evolution through the cosmos which is an internal process and not an external process of modification at all so again this idea that we're sitting at the feet of of, of these alien gurus or we're these th these interdimensional beings are our parents and they created us you know here we are again finding this issue where it actually stops our growth but because these beings seem to have more technology than us, they know more than us, we want to just throw it out the window. We want to throw our sovereignty out the window. And that's not going to go very well. The other thing that we see in the, in the New Age community especially is this idea of, of ET saviors, alien saviors. These federations of aliens that are really controlling the Earth. And we're here in this fundamentally infantile position where we have these aliens that basically treat us like children and are going to come in, swoop in and save us and solve all of our environmental problems, solve all of our social problems. And we don't really have to dig deep and develop anything ourselves. No, we have these parent-like aliens that are going to come down because they've already done everything because they already know everything because they're already so superior and we're just children in the kindergarten of the cosmos they're going to come down and they're going to answer all those questions and they're just waiting for the right time and we have to experience all of this conflict and you know there are it, it is true that there are certain interdimensional beings that do guard the earth and that do guard humanity that is true but we're seeing that principle being taken and distorted in such a strange way that it is stopping spiritual growth by creating savior figures. So this is another danger that we see. And all of this could be very, very easily prevented if we just had a good contact protocol, a good psychic protocol, a good understanding of how this works. That could be avoided. Okay, so that's what we're really going to get into today. So what the difference is, is we, we really need to be able to discern these beings ourself, not just discern whether or not we like the information, whether or not this channel helped us manifest our dream car or whether or not they helped us with our law of attraction stuff. Um, we're, we really need to look at these, these entities and discern exactly what their connection is to the earth, why they are here. And consider that they could be lying. Okay, that's very, very, very important. So we are being challenged now to relate differently to the spiritual world. We need to be able to read interdimensionals energy ourselves and not just judge them by the quality of information that we think they're giving. So it's not about the information, whether you like it. We have to begin to actually read the energy that is being emitted from the entity and go in so far into that read, that discernment process, that we are able to see what timeline that entity is on in relationship to our planet. 
and to us. This is a very deep read. <laughs> Usually we're not reading that deeply into different beings. Usually we're just automatically assuming that a being is greater than us because they're in a different dimension that's not as physical. We must be able to determine exactly who is speaking, what their connection is with earth and humanity, why they are why, where they are in their own evolution. We need more context. We need deeper reads on beings that communicate. So let's go into this, um, deeper into this idea of what a timeline is and how, how can a, how can an interdimensional be a timeline? How can, how can I try to read an, an alien and then read so deeply into that being that suddenly I see a timeline. How does that happen? What is that? Well, this is exactly what happens when you zoom out in your, in your perspective and you ask the right questions. You begin to see that every single, single alien, every single interdimensional is actually from a timeline. Now, by definition, an alien or an interdimensional is not from this time. I'm gonna say that again, by definition, an alien or interdimensional is not from this time. They have a relationship to this time, but if they were not born into the life wave of the planet, through a woman's womb, they are not of this planet fully. So there is a difference between being born on the earth and being born into this time organically through a woman, directly connecting yourself with the earth and everything that it is in the cosmos and everything it is in relationship to other spheres. That is called the life wave or the rope of consciousness. For more information on this, I recommend going back and watching my The Solar System as a School lecture. That's going to explain that a lot deeper. So if there is a being that is technically outside the life wave, outside the rope of consciousness, we see those beings as interdimensional or as aliens. They are visiting our life wave. They're visiting our rope of consciousness. They are from fundamentally another time. Okay, they're not from this earth. They're not, they're, they're not born into this life wave. There's a difference there. There's a junction there. And that's what we have to learn to understand. And this goes for positive or evolution-based beings that are here to help humanity integrate and ascend. And this also goes for negative entities, polarizing entities that are here to parasitically live off of humanity. So it doesn't matter um, this principle. There are interdimensional beings that are technically of the light and they are also not part of the life wave necessarily, not directly. And so there is a junction there that you can read as well. That's why it's so important to really highlight that being born as a human organically is very, very, very important because it means something in this world. It means something in this cosmos. It means that you're in the evolutionary path. It is the most important thing to evolution is to be able to take a life on earth organically in a body and then link up to all these aspects of your higher self and integrate them. That is the most important thing. But there's all of these beings. You could view them as different timelines of humanity that surround the earth because they were once of the earth or have a connection to the earth that interact with us for our benefit or, or, or for our detriment. So by definition, aliens or interdimensionals are not of this world. And we have to understand exactly why and exactly where they came from if they're not of this world because sometimes this gets conflated and 
the whole cosmos becomes our home. And we're all living in one giant cosmos that is just under one great God and we're all brothers and sisters in the universe. And maybe that is true to some degree. But by doing that, you lose the entire stratification of the cosmos as an initiatory school. You can't just take a star and just assume that it's on the same dimensional plane that we are. You can't just take a planet and assume that it also has a three, some kind of 3D meaning when it could be actually radiating from a much higher plane. We can't flatten the cosmos into a lower form. We have to view it as a multidimensional system because it is. And different stars and different planets represent different uh, densities of consciousness. This is what a stargate is. So we have to learn what that system is. And part of how we learn that is we learn how these beings use those systems. When we understand that, we understand our own initiatory path through the cosmos. So how do we grow as individuals? How do you ascend? How do you get out of this mortal coil? We have to go through very specific cosmic initiation cycles, very specific um, incarnations on different spheres over periods of time that evolve our spirit with, with, with each kind of sphere or star representing specific archetypal lessons. And these spheres and planets, they overlap with ours from different realms. And then this is how we get teachers. And this is also how we get lower beings, okay? So we have to learn that this is what the cosmos is. We look out there, we do not just see comets that we can mine for whatever minerals we need to continue our intense, you know, development. We have to begin to see it as a multidimensional space. The planets are much more than we think they are. And again, this system exists in theosophy. The system exists in anthroposophy and the system exists in ancient Vedic texts and Tibetan texts and also in the Atlantean wisdom. We are in a very strange and weird period where we have forgotten this again. So, If an entity appears and they're clearly not in our life wave, right? You know, we know that when we, we know when a being is an interdimensional when they're when and when they're a human that's born here, that's born out of the earth through through an earth mother. Um, if the entity is not from our life wave, which is our time space, like an ET, it has clearly evolved out of our current form. It is not our form because our form is also defined by the time in which we are born. So if you're out of this time, then you've technically, you're not this form. And so we have to, we have to define what that evolution is that they've taken. Is it a devolution or is it an evolution? We have to figure out what that differential is. What is the difference? So every interdimensional, is a trajectory of consciousness. Every interdimensional that you see is an evolutionary story. So every difference, you know, say we're looking at the, um, at like a higher human, that is an organic human being that has through transmutation, through holy transmutation, has evolved their form into a higher form that has something that in the Eastern mysteries we would call cities. They've been able to light up their spiritual circuitry, light up their DNA through inner transmutation, and they've been able to become a master. Okay? And that mastership for us on Earth will also be associated with certain stars or certain planetary spheres, which we can get in later in, in the Star Wisdom series. So you can look at that individual and you can say, well, this person isn't like me. This is a master. This is a higher exalted guide. So what do they have that I don't? 
what evolution have they gone through that I haven't? And then that's where you learn what that differential is. And that's how you can learn um, how far they are along in their evolution. And that higher human that has developed these cities, um, that being um, that being will represent the trajectory for humanity out of matter. That being will represent the trajectory for humanity that is the ascension timeline, the, the, the ascended evolution. And by working with that, with that being, that presence, that probably your higher self or your guides, you align with that timeline, okay? And you are drawn upward. You follow that path. So we discern what that being is, what they have that we don't, why are we different? And then we realize that that is a timeline or a trajectory, that difference. And then we, we say, is this an ascension timeline or is this a descension timeline? Is this a degradating timeline? And by working with those beings, we actually end up aligning with their timeline. This is what a lot of, this is what we miss is that when we follow a teacher, when you're on YouTube and you're watching a teacher, it's not just fun, okay? It's not just entertainment. You are aligning with the timeline that that teacher is connected to based on the beings that they are channeling. You are aligning with a trajectory, an evolutionary trajectory, okay? This is why this is very important. So, Every interdimensional that we see represents an entire swath of time that spans thousands of years, many, many thousands of years, maybe hundreds of thousands of years. They represent a specific evolutionary path of mankind. It's not just a being, it's their entire evolutionary path, their entire timeline that you are tuning into and aligning with. You want to make that an ascension timeline. We want to make that a timeline of transmutation, of evolution, of positive evolution, eventually out of this material plane back into the higher realms one day. Okay. We can look at it this way as well. Every interdimensional or alien is following a specific life impulse. They're living by an impulse, a belief system, a code, a religion, a spirituality that they have, that they live by, we all do. And because of that, they have an overarching archetypal tone to their entire existence. What is that? Okay, we have to figure out what that is. One easy way to view it is that there are really only two impulses. One is the life impulse and one is the death impulse. We have to get these impulses right in our life. If we go too far into either way, we tend to get imbalanced. So you could also view it as actually the best way to view it is that there's the Christ impulse, which is, or the Christ stream, which is complete balance and harmony. And then there's the antichrist impulse, which is, you can see that as complete imbalance, being totally out of balance, having tons of fear, not having the full picture. Now, the antichrist impulse leads to degradation and regression over time. And it leads to the loss of your entire being if you stay on that path. Any timelines that are aligned with that antichrist impulse, if you're not able to get off of it, will lead to your demise. As a being in this system, you have to go back to the beginning, as I mentioned in my eighth sphere lecture. Okay. Then there is the Christ impulse, what we would call the Christ impulse, which is a solar impulse. And this impulse is what we reckon ourselves against. And there are beings that are within this Christ impulse that are great avatars, great adepts, 
that are just a little bit further along than maybe the average human. And we're all looking to align with that impulse and take more and more of it on in our life and transmute more of our pain and take more of this beautiful Christ consciousness on and transmute what we no longer need or release karma or whatever verbiage you want to use. And when we do that, we find ourselves lifting into higher timelines and higher ways of being. We find ourselves developing cities. We find ourselves developing higher abilities that we thought we'd lost. Remembering who we are, traversing the cosmos. When we align with that Christ impulse, that Christ stream, we begin to return to who we are. When we align with that, with that antichrist stream, we begin to unzip and lose everything. And this is the tightrope that we walk on this plane. And it's a very difficult, it's a very difficult way of being in this, on this earth, on this 3D plane, because there's a lot of illusion and there's a lot of, there's a lot of people in your life or beings and um, that will project or present as though they're very holy. But in reality, it's an illusion. So this is why we're having this conversation. So ultimately, you could view the Christ impulse as existing throughout time as the evolutionary impulse, the impulse that causes all positive evolution in man. And where we are, it's completely internal at this point. Um, we, we, we actually move into higher timelines, connect with higher versions of ourselves and guides through through basically aligning with that impulse and 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 healing ourselves making ourselves lighter and lighter and getting more and more vision and moving into you know higher timelines if you will and of course those timelines are positive evolutionary path but the organic evolutionary path right and then the antichrist timelines are literally the 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 regression and degradation those are the two streams and they have actual timelines in them Okay, and we'll get a little bit more into that later. And so we can also say that the impulse of different interdimensional beings is quite frankly going to be progressive or regressive based on what timeline they're in and their, their beliefs. There are some beings that do seem to be purely chaotic, but ultimately even those beings, why tune into those beings and you could tune into a genuine high, your genuine higher self that is exalted or something that's not in complete turmoil or chaos, right? So we've got to observe them with their timeline in mind, which does involve being able to quantify what you're seeing, to qualify what you're seeing and say, Okay, this being looks like this, they have these qualities. We do have to do that a little bit in order to understand the qualities of the different interdimensionals that are visiting us and why they are the way they are. Um, we do have to do that a little bit, even though I think a lot of spiritual people feel very against the idea of classifying beings as good or bad or whatever. There's like this repulsion to do that. Um, when in reality, if we don't have some qualifications on what we're seeing, then we're never going to understand it. We're never going to be able to truly work with, with, their, with, with, with what they are. Okay. Okay. The other thing that we want to be able to discern, you know, beyond what their evolutionary path is, is we want to be able to discern what is your connection to the earth. So why are you here? Why are you communicating with us? What's in it for you? What is the exchange that you're receiving? You know, why, why are you here? Is it because it's part of your evolution? You know, we have to, we have to very, very specifically understand why they are here and even deeper than that perhaps this is the best way to word it what is their connection to the earth 
because fundamentally, every single being that you see has a connection to the earth. They have a connection to the human body template or the earth. They are of the earth at some point in their development. Okay. If they weren't, they wouldn't be able to see it. We wouldn't be able to perceive them. There would be no common language to be able to, to observe it. Okay. So we have to say, what is your connection to the earth? What timeline of the earth are you from? What evolutionary path of humanity are you? Okay, is this a progressive path? Is this a regressive path? What are the exact details? Okay, so what timeline of humanity are they? You know, did they, what path did they take? And usually, what we're looking at, just to be specific, usually like what we're looking at when we look at different interdimensionals is we usually end up seeing human looking beings, um, sometimes angelic looking, um, and then we end up seeing sort of non-human looking interdimensionals. And with the non-human looking interdimensionals, like the various different types of grays, and then also the chimera beings, which are part lizard or part insect or part animal. Usually with those beings, we tend to have a very difficult time understanding what their connection is to the earth because they look so, 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 so different to us. Um, so, oh, also cyborgs and different types of sort of... Um, transhumanist bot beings and stuff like that. When we get into that conversation, um, we are looking at certain timelines of humanity um, associated with Atlantis and certain uh, timelines of humanity that have done a lot of DNA altering, a lot of um, magic through uh, chimeras and things like this. and. What ends up happening, I think, in the spiritual community is we think that all these beings are technically from different stars. Um, and there's a lot more to this that we have to get into. Okay. I'm going to leave that there for now. But, um, but we will be addressing that in the next few lectures, sort of the different, um, how we can relate to two beings that seem very different from us. Okay. So, where we have been in it, where I think we've been um, is sort of only perceiving like little pieces of timelines or just perceiving little pieces of, of what these beings are. And I think that we now have to put the big picture together. We now have to create the big picture. We now have to have a more, um, specific scientific multi-dimensional view of of human life in such a large massive scale that it actually includes the solar system as a school we have to begin to interact with these interdimensional beings as different aspects of ourself which is really how it's really the only way that we can even understand what they are this idea that they are just from different star systems and they live around different star systems and there's really no connection to us. That's a materialistic perspective. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So if you could look at the earth, you know, if you could look at the earth with like a clairvoyant eye from a very high dimension, what you would see is perhaps the earth at a very, very dense 3D plane with us on it, um, the, the human born on the earth. And then you would see all of these different beings surrounding it in the probably the fourth dimension mainly or, 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 the, or, the, or the, the density just above where we are. And then kind of less and less as we go up, but the, the higher ones are definitely the more healed and exalted ones. And then kind of in the lower planes, you'd see all of these different beings surrounding the earth. And you'd see all of these different timelines weaving into the earth through different 
spheres and different things and it's kind of like a web it's kind of like a like like a mess of timelines um, that are connected to these various different beings and those would be surrounding the earth weaving in in it kind of in and out of the earth's energy body okay so in other words part of the earth's part of the earth's energetic body is actually these different timelines and different entities and they sort of always you know there's this when you have a 3d planet that is material that's physical we are the densest level of the earth what ends up happening is that beings end up coming back to this plane um, in order to consolidate their karma um, or to evolve themselves um, they come here because it's such a powerful and intense place to be for consolidation and change and alchemy. And so a lot of beings will come back here um, and they'll want to get back into these. They will want to get back into the consciousness of the earth. They've made mistakes or, you know, part of their evolutionary path is serving the earth. And that's how they get further in their own evolutionary path. But it's out of love. And so the earth is really this place of intense alchemy, intense growth and intense consolidation that many, many different beings are interested in because from here you can really, depending on your life here, what you can accomplish here, um, you can really exalt yourself. Um, and uh, especially at our time now where we're not, we're not yet at those future timelines where we're, dabbling with our DNA and we're playing God and we're kind of um, merging with machines and doing all this inorganic stuff that essentially damages our DNA so bad, damages our body so bad that we're, we're just, we're not honestly as, as um, I guess you could say full of spirit. The potential isn't, isn't there anymore when we do that to ourselves. So where we are now is, is actually pretty significant to a lot of different beings in the cosmos. What we are is very significant. What the planet is, is very, very significant because we're still in a point of purity because we have not yet, many of the people have not yet started to alter themselves. Um, and yet we're far enough advanced that we're not, you know, way back in earlier time periods where our mind wasn't as developed, okay? So we are surrounded by different timelines of humanity. We are surrounded on this planet by different timelines of ourself. They represent different evolutionary paths that human beings can take. To understand interdimensionals or aliens, we must begin to read not only the being, not only if we like the information or whatever, we must begin to see what is their evolutionary path in the solar system. What timeline of humanity are they? This allows us to have real sovereign communication with higher beings that's effective. And also it allows us to grow and to evolve. Okay, so usually when these teachings come out and, and people hear them, um, it, it usually causes some recoil and people usually start to feel confused or maybe even offended or shocked. And they'll often call these teachings about these beings being so intimately related to us and so intimately related to the earth they usually call those teachings earth centric or human centric as though, you know, viewing things that way is in some way selfish or small minded, uh, not advanced um, and or that you're protecting yourself somehow by wanting to relate everything to you or that you're romanticizing the human form, you're romanticizing the earth. Um, by making everything relate back to it. That's a very popular response from um, the New Age. 
Um, and so I really, I really think that it, we should address that and why it's not earth centric and why not having this perspective is actually an example of extreme spiritual materialism and, you know, not understanding the initiatory planes of the cosmos and how we actually interact and live in the cosmos. It's just a, you know, it's just a complete materialistic view of esoterica to not view it in an earth centric way. Okay. So the other thing that, so basically the idea for many people is that ETs aren't related to us at all. The only thing is, is that we share a God or a cosmos. Okay. So the reason why when we get into the esoterica of this, it becomes earth centric is that we are human beings and we live on earth. And based on that, based on our own existence, we can only really perceive what we are. We can only perceive what we are. This is, this is the cosmic law. We see this with the law of attraction, you know, where if you get into certain frequencies, um, your vision will change. That is true. But there is a template that is the earth template, and that is the human template. And that earth human template for us is of this time and space. Our form represents this time and space. And it is a template. It is a template. And so when we look out psychically into the cosmos, we're only going to be able to perceive other forms of that template. It's not that other types of beings don't exist, say crystal beings or these different types of life in the cosmos. It's not that that doesn't exist, it does. There's more types of life than we could ever imagine. What I'm saying is that we can't perceive it and that our specific perception on the earth is a spectrum and that there are limitations. And there are limitations because we have to have something solid that we're working with. We're, we're literally like when we incarnate on the earth and on the 3D plane of the earth where we are now, we are condensing so much information. And when we come into that much information, we can only perceive a certain spectrum looking out. You know, when you wake up in the morning, you're not perceiving every single spectrum of light. You're not perceiving infrared when you wake up. It doesn't make you any less of a person because you're not waking up and seeing infrared along with your vision. You're not seeing, you know, ultraviolet. You're not seeing beyond that spectrum either. It doesn't mean that you're not a holy being. It doesn't mean you're less than. It's just that we have a specific spectrum of cosmic life or we have a specific spectrum that we can see, that we can perceive, that we can interact with based on where we are in our time and space based on our template, okay? Does this make sense? So we can only perceive what we are. This means that we cannot perceive the levels of life in this cosmos that are not connected to our own earth human existence. So this is obviously for our own growth and this is so that we can evolve. And this, I, and, and in esoterica, there is the, this concept is everywhere. It's as above, so below. We live in a, in, in a hall of mirrors. Everything around us, when we start getting into interdimensionals, is an aspect of ourselves in a different timeline. And that is so that we can actually see a version of ourselves and decide whether or not we want to move into that evolutionary path, whether or not we want to take that path and also how to take it because those beings will radiate their truth. And we want, we need to see that and decide, do I want to go down that path? Do I want to go down the path of evolution? Or do I want to go path, down a path of devolution and regression? We need to see that representation as a being. 
And then we make a decision. So is, it, is, it, is there any wonder that while we're in this intense time of purging, this end times, if you will, that suddenly we're having all this massive conversation about these, these interdimensionals and UFOs and aliens and, and all of that? Yes, because they begin to appear into our vision in an intense way to show us the initiation that we are at. And at this time, our choice is to choose an organic path of growth with our Christ consciousness intact, evolving us through inner transmutation, or to go down a path of complete degradation and regression by believing that we evolve through physically changing ourselves, through mutilating our DNA, which often in, in, the, in the ET scene is often called hybridization, which we'll get in another lecture, we'll get to why that happens. But there is no spiritual growth through changing your DNA. That's not how that, that that's not how humanity evolves. How humanity evolves is through going inward and using our own inner Christ consciousness and using our heart to transform ourselves in light of our DNA. And there is no modification. There is no eugenics like creating a master race. There is no merging with machines. That is the, the, the continuation of complete and total materialism and reductionism, culminating in this idea that we actually evolve and grow through material means, through reductive means. But we have to see that timeline glaring in front of our face in its entirety. We have to see what we will become should we choose that. And this is why we see these deformed, mutilated humans that often lie to us because of their desperation to heal what they have done to themselves. And this is why you'll see this weird spattering, this weird group of beings, this hodgepodge of like these, you know, Nordic looking Pleiadian, Venusian looking beings with greys around them and all these kind of chimeric beings and stuff that are clearly going down a dark path. Yeah, because that's the entire evolutionary spectrum of that timeline degrading from a human form which is often called Nordic in, in UFO literature, all the way down to when they modified themselves into a shadow of themselves. That is an entire timeline we are seeing. Because once you develop interdimensionality, time travel, what you're seeing is you're seeing the exact same individuals the exact same branch of humanity, breakaway aspect of humanity, if you will, looping back in, in different forms of themselves as they degrade or as they evolve. But it's us, it's us. And one of the biggest illusions that the regressive, the regressive timeline of humanity will tell you is that the cosmos is populated with all of these different aliens. And there's these, uh, the, the whole goal is to create one big kind of cosmic force um, and that we all kind of have to come together underneath one world government or one world force and kind of not have sovereignty. There's a whole agenda with this. But what, what you're looking at is actually one real timeline of humanity in many ways that's done these various different things and created a complete inversion of a higher cosmos. So there are another, I want to be clear, there are different types of interdimensionals that are very exalted and can look different in different life forms and things like that. But humanity doesn't really begin to seriously connect with that unless they're at a certain stage of development where they can begin to see beyond themselves and their ego is dissolved to the point where they can begin to perceive things beyond their own ego. And that's when we, we begin to open up to these genuine higher worlds of beings that look very different than us. But 
people knew about that. And so they create that there's a false cosmos that exists in the lower astral plane that is a complete mockery and inversion of that higher cosmos that humanity will evolve into once it gets beyond its kind of selfish materialistic nature. So does this make sense, this idea of a false cosmos, an inverted cosmos that's entirely been populated by regressive aspects of humanity? I will do a full lecture on this, but I want to make sure that that's clear. So this is why we have to understand that these are different these are different aspects. These are if, if you add interdimensionality and time travel and you add huge swaths of time, you're going to get beings that look very, very, very different than what we would look like in our natural evolutionary path, right? But there's something human in there. No matter how weird they look, there's something human in there for us to be able to perceive it. And we have to figure out what that is and, and why and, and, and do the differential for that. Okay. We have a specific template that we incarnated into and perceive everything around us based on that template, right? So the template thus has a specific spectrum of life that it, that it can perceive, that we can perceive. We perceive everything based on our own template, even, even when it comes to the human template in the cosmos, okay? Generally, we can perceive a bit above our own capacity and then below our own capacity. Okay. So when we're looking out and we're connecting with, we're connecting with the cosmos, generally what we're going to perceive is a few degrees above our own consciousness. Okay. A little bit more exalted. And then we're going to perceive, I guess I should be doing this a little bit below our consciousness. So our spectrum is sort of like a little bit above where we are and a little bit below where we are. So we're technically able, we're, we're technically kind of perceiving into the chaos world and the dark world to a degree, pull downward into that a little bit, or we're also exposed and perceiving a little bit above where we are personally, okay? And so this is why when we begin to heal and raise our frequency, we begin to eventually move out of the chaos realms altogether as our spectrum of, of perception goes upward, right? So this is usually where angels and demons come from because we're usually, as we're deep in this, in, in this 3D plane, we're interacting with both of those aspects of, of ourself. So I also find that um, when we learn this, that we kind of have a specific perception, I feel like we can just relax and things get simpler, things get easier. And we're not always sort of, I think, in shock when we understand that there is an order to things, there is a metaphysics, there is a spiritual science to contacting interdimensional beings. There is, there is a science, there is a method to the madness. We're not just surrounded by complete, complete chaos. And one of the biggest mistakes I think we can make as mystics, and I think that we're all, we're, I think that we're all guilty of it at different times. I know I have been. Um, where you believe, where you believe that you're farther ahead in your own development than you are. So sometimes we assume that we're in a more advanced state and then we can take things for granted in the psychic world. Like we automatically think a being is good or we think that we are farther along in our development and we think we're in a 5D state or a higher state 
and that certain beings could never be negative. Um, a lot of the times, because we fell from really within us, there are memories of communicating with sort of beings that, that are look different than us or living in a cosmic life, especially if you're mystic. And we sometimes take that higher dimensional way of living in existence that really isn't available to us at this time. Um, and we plaster it over where we are now. So we think that we're like a fifth dimensional being or this higher exalted being. Um, and we're living in this 5D cosmos, which is different than a 3D cosmos completely. And so we project that higher cosmos that we kind of remember onto this lower world and we don't realize how specific we have to become and how much we have to understand time and space in this 3D plane. So we think that we're actually in a different dimension than we are sometimes. And I think that that is sort of like a disorientation that a lot of psychics can get in when they do cosmic work is, um, is projecting a higher version of the cosmos on top of where we actually are, which is actually, uh, which is actually has a lower astral plane that we have to get through in order to get to that higher version. Does this make sense? Definitely ask me in the comments below if this is making sense, this idea of perceiving a way higher dimensional version of the cosmos and projecting it here and not understanding where we are. But, but I mean, um, A lot of a lot of times this is often also because we don't like boundaries. We don't like rules, we don't like laws and a lot of people will come into mysticism or spirituality and it really has a strong luciferian impulse to why um people find their spirit and it it is really fundamentally to uh not feel suffering anymore. It's to not feel trapped. It's, 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 it's to not feel held back. Oftentimes, especially if you're interested in this material, it's to not feel limited by the world. And so sometimes when we come into our practice as mystics, we avoid any type of spiritual law, any type of responsibility, any type of um, what we perceive as a limitation because we're still looking at our spirituality to be freeing for us. Fundamentally, we just want it to feel free. But unfortunately, this is a real discipline. It's just like learning physics. It's just like learning how to cook. It's just like learning how to fix a car. This is a real discipline. This metaphysics is an art, yes, but it's also a science. It's also a discipline. And so when we come to it from this, um, uh, th this desire to just be free and never have any limitations and never ever be told anything, you're not going to have an honest experience in your own development because, you know, we're coming at it from a place of just purely wanting freedom, which isn't a sophisticated enough desire to actually learn how the cosmos works, okay? And, and fundamentally, to assume that we human beings today can perceive anything at any time, um, any being in existence, any plane of existence, any time is really like assuming a God-like ability. Really, if, if you're coming from this unlimited perspective, this overly freedom wanting perspective, and you start to believe that there are no, there are no edges, there, there is no template, there is no spectrum that you're viewing through, there is no exact template that you're viewing through, you're not limited by anything. That is basically like taking on the perspective like you are God, that you can see everything in creation, that you are not limited at all. You can see every being, every strip of time. 
And that's where things get very dangerous in spirituality is when you begin to, we don't realize that we do that, but we don't understand what our limitations are. We don't want to learn them because we came here to be free, not to learn. So we have to understand that these laws or these limitations that come with being incarnated in this time, space, and dimension, they're not a curse. They're not something that's meant to hold you back. There's something that's meant to allow you to relax into who you truly are. There's something that allows you to really understand what's going on around you, how to really interpret these different beings. You know, we're not coming into spirituality to escape. That's not sustainable, it's not healthy. We are coming here to really learn and remember who we are, to truly grow. And in order to do that, we have to understand the parameters that we are in, the parameters of our vision, the parameters of our senses. And I promise that, you know, we are in such a dense time that even small little developments in your clairvoyance, even the smallest little developments in your claircognizance will feel like that leap will it, it'll it'll feel like a leap it'll feel like um intense growth okay so these limitations provide an evolutionary imp uh, an evolutionary purpose we can only perceive what we are this means that we can perceive time that we can perceive timelines that are that represent our potential futures we perceive our fallen selves. We perceive the fallen humanity, the humanity that took regressive timelines that led to their own demise, a dead evolutionary path. We can perceive that. And we can also perceive our ascended selves. We can perceive the one timeline that is going out of this reality that has no divergences in it. We can also perceive that. And we can perceive the beings and the aspects of ourself or however you want to mention that, that are within that timeline. We can align with them and we can be lifted, okay? So while there is a vast cosmos full of life, we have limitations in what we can actually perceive. Because we are of the earth and human, we will perceive ourselves in different timelines. We will perceive our own potential futures. For this reason, we must approach all interdimensional beings as though they are us and understand why they are here, what they want and what they represent. This phenomenon is a mystery because we make it one because we don't ask the right questions and we don't have a working spiritual cosmology. And when we look at the disclosure movement, you know, that's mainly run by the CIA or the government, you know, this question is never asked. We don't ask who these beings are to us and what they are to us. And it's, it's an extremely materialist view where we're just focusing on what technologies they have. Literally the most meaningless aspect of this phenomenon is like what technologies they have. So, you know, we are approaching this not only from an infantile level in that we're not understanding what the phenomenon actually is, the deeper meaning, or actually looking at it from a regressive standpoint by focusing on literally the most materialistic militaristic aspect of it. So we need to reorient this, especially in the spiritual community. We need to be versed in this because the reason why we are not being told what's going on in our skies and all of this is so suppressed is to create a deficit. Make no mistake. This is, stuff is going on, stuff went on last night in the skies. Stuff is going to go on tonight in the skies. Nobody, no, there, there, there's no public conversation. And if you do have one, you're going to be humiliated. 
That is the condition of this conversation in society. And that is on purpose. The whole thing is, is say nothing, reveal nothing, hoard all the information for yourself. These powerful people in these powerful societies. And then one day, one day when everybody is hurt and broken and has gone through a crazy virus or war, whatever else we can look forward to, one day just reveal it all. And with that, because you and I know that there is no conversation about the cosmos or interdimensionals or even technology unless it's a spiritual conversation. All roads lead to consciousness. Even the highest technologies are run eventually by consciousness and eventually by the individual's capacity to hold psychic energy. It all leads here. So let's start now. Let's not let it be we are starved of this conversation by certain people who have hoarded it for themselves. And then we're so shocked when we hear it, we're fumbling around and we don't know what to do. And then we start to accept information and connections with beings and all of this stuff that does not benefit us. No. We can learn how this works and we can create the future that we want that is the genuine opening up of cosmic consciousness and humanity and the genuine evolution of humanity, truly understanding what these beings are, our own evolution in the cosmos. That is where we will go. And we will take nothing less. And that is why this information is important. That is why this conversation is important. Okay. The next level of this conversation is really interesting because we're going to talk about the different we're going to talk about we're going to talk about why we can see timelines as evolutionary paths. So all timelines all evolutionary paths have very specific little junctions in them. They're kind of like little joints or little splittings that happen. And these are called evolutionary points. And at these junction points, humanity goes through a, I guess you could say a transformation. Usually it's at end times or during the dark age, kind of like where we are now. And at these, and at these junction points in, in our evolution, in time, a higher form of humanity forms or a more evolved form of humanity will form but then also there will be certain soul essences that do not understand what that junction point is. And they will begin to regress and form often a divergent timeline, or they won't be able to continue incarnating in the rope of consciousness. Now in anthroposophy, it's made very clear that the cosmos is an evolutionary path. We can see Saturn, as being sort of like the beginning of our materialization, even though everything's kind of external and outside of us and we're sort of more externally connected, uh, then we turn, then the then our evolutionary journey turns into what we would recognize as a solar phase or the sun. And then after that, we go through a lunar phase and the moon forms. And then after that, after all of that kind of after all of those evolutionary jumps and at that and at that point we're also moving down in dimension and density we're becoming denser and denser and denser and denser there's all these little initiation points that the human form has to achieve in order to get into that next phase of development and then if we don't make that evolutionary phase we kind of go outside and in anthroposophy a good example of this is um before we were as dense as we are now so this is like in more of a spiritual plane, we have, you know, the Luciferic spirits that never really evolved past a certain plane and still interact with us, but they're actually outside of the evolutionary impulse of mankind. They're outside of the life wave and the rope of consciousness of the earth, technically. They interact with us and connect with us in our higher bodies um, in order to try to evolve, but they're not really they're not really the same thing as what, what, what our true soul essence is when we incarnate here. 
So there are these junction points. And then where we are at the earth now, we are experiencing this complete internalization of everything that's external. And everything becomes about understanding our inner world. And then we begin to now evolve out of matter that we fell into and get lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. And there will be evolutionary points as we get lighter and lighter and lighter that will represent these jumps in our consciousness and specific points of evolution. So when we see timelines and we can say, oh, is this a regressive timeline or is this an, a progressive timeline? We can see that if a timeline is regressive, um, that the individuals in it, by definition, did not pass an initiation. So there was an initiation, there was a junction point. They were exposed to certain cosmic pressures. And when, all, when it all came down to it, they made the wrong decision and they went against nature. And that creates a divergent timeline that is parallel for a time to the evolutionary timeline. But once you get to another jump in evolution, eventually divergent timelines will dissolve. And so there's this intense desire for any beings, any human beings that have taken a divergent timeline, there's an intense desire for them to interact with earth humans on the organic path of evolution and try to get back in. That's an intense desire because if you take a divergent path, you risk losing all of your progress up to this point. So this is the kind of spiritual crisis that beings get in, that, that, that a path of humanity got in, if you will. So humanity evolves in precise stages and they represent a very specific initiation. Before this point, it was all about densifying into matter in the right way, right? Becoming heavier, more integrated. And then now as we move forward, it's about lightening that up. And those are what our initiations are gonna be more about. And of course, there's great teachers and avatars that come and embody every single initiation, adepts that come to for mankind, okay? And this is why if you look again in anthroposophy, you'll see that every, every age or every era has an archetypal purpose. You know, if you, if you look into Steiner's anthroposophy, he goes through and he clearly says that this is the Lemurian epoch. And, you know, in his book, you know, Cosmic Memory, he very clearly describes the level of initiation that humanity was in during the Lemurian phase, what their body was like. You know, um, he describes the Lemurian form as being more airy. And, and, you know, if you look into theosophy, Blavatsky describes the Lemurian form as having, as being like jelly with these fish-like bones in it. Well, that was a different level of a different evolutionary phase of humanity. In order to get that next form, you know, the Atlantean form, there has to be spe a specific uh, transmutations that have to occur. You have to, you reach a junction point, you have to evolve, right? And then you evolve into the Atlantean form. And then now we have our form and every single epoch represents a different type of consciousness. It represents a different phase in humanity. And so we are moving, and this is why you also have, you know, in astrology, you have the zodiac and moving through all these different cycles, just because we're tracking our own initiations. And that's how we track our own spiritual development in the cosmos. So let's talk a little bit about, again, about our initiation today, which is really to go inward and be sovereign after many, many, many lifetimes of 
having an extreme external focus where almost all of our sense organs were outside of us. Anthroposophy describes this as well. Um, now everything is inside. Now everything has come inward. And now we have to learn to radiate that. Okay, so um, after many lifetimes of external focus and more of a childlike relationship with God, we have to now become our own sovereign beings and grow up and evolve. And all of that growth has to come from inside out. We're no longer in, you know, the outside in. Although that outside in, that material impulse, that belief that the, the material world is pure, that the material world is holy, and that we can evolve ourselves by just basically only focusing on the material world, that is no longer relative. And this is what the great Eastern mysteries and teachers were telling us. They were saying, you know, the external world is Maya. We don't evolve through focusing externally. And now we're even evolving even a bit beyond that now even. But there's still this divergent portion of mankind that is existing on this planet right now, but also communicating with versions of themselves that believe that through extreme material focus and reductionism, scientism, materialism, that they're going to evolve. They didn't get the memo. They still think everything is through the external world. They still think that if they can just, that they can know God by splitting atoms over and over and over again and getting to the smallest and smallest and smallest part that one day that'll give them the secrets of the universe. We don't learn through reductionism. We don't evolve through that. There was a period of time where we were in that mode, but humanity was much more pure we hadn't fallen yet. And so, of course, the external world was more of a direct reflection of, of, of God because we were not fallen. And so we were one with nature. We were one with each other. We were one with God. And everything that happened around us was an example of God. It was pure because we were pure. But when we fall into this dimension, into the 3D plane, especially the depth that we are in now, there's another level added to our evolution. And it is that we are now creators. And so the world that we see around us represents what? Ourselves, our perspective, our template. It's not an exact representative of God. You're not perceiving as a God. What we perceive and see in the material world represents us. And this is why when you even get to the most deep level of physics, it switches the double slit experiment. It changes because of consciousness, because it's our consciousness, our template, that defines what this plane is, defines where we go, what timelines we go into, where we evolve. Everything that's physical is literally responding to us. It is not objective. But the divergent timeline does not understand this, okay? We can identify different kinds of beings on their last, we can identify different kinds of beings or divergent paths of humanity based on their last evolutionary junction or based on the initiation that they failed or based on the initiation that they passed. Now, if it's a higher human, a higher being, they're going to appear superhuman right? Because they've passed an initiation that we have. And if our initiation is to develop all of our cities and all of our deep powers that we've lost, it is to, it, we become more human. We become superhuman, not less. You know? So we will understand that by looking at, by, but we, we will be able to understand that that's what that being is. It's a higher human with more. They become superhuman. They radiate. They have different capacities than we do. And then we can also see regressive timelines because often they will no longer look human. 
They will be humans that were spliced with different things. Machines, animals, um, whatever that may be. Or they've gone through intense eugenics programs like we see with some of the Nordics. Um, a lot of gene splicing going on there. Not a lot of real spiritual evolution, just a lot of gene splicing and eugenics going on. So we have to look and say, what is their last evolutionary junction? Did they pass their level of initiation or did they fail? And remember that the human being is the template. It's our template, it's our vision. The earth is our template, it's our vision. We can only perceive what's within it. It's, it's, um, and that it's a lot because the earth is literally the compressed solar system into the tightest form. So we actually have, we can actually perceive a lot, but there are limitations. We have to look at a being and say, is this being from a regressed timeline? Is it dying? Um, is that why they're communicating with us? Is, is the timeline a dead timeline? Um, so we have, we have to begin to ask these questions. Okay. So I'm going to touch on, um, I just want to add something. So, um, we have to understand also that higher worlds have timelines too. So we, when we look at the different planetary spheres, um, they are different timelines of mankind as well. Um, so some of the planetary spheres, like, for example, Jupiter or uh, Saturn, um, to a degree, the moon, um, most of the planetary spheres are in a dimension and density that is too beyond where we are. Um, and so we'll actually perceive those dramas through the inner spheres so or the spheres that are kind of closer to the Earth. So the two main spheres or the two main planetary schools that are the most parallel to our Earth or the closest to our Earth are really Mars, Venus, and Mercury. And then the sun to a degree, but we basically receive those solar rays through them being translated through the planetary sphere. So we can't actually take on the energy of the sun. It's way too big, it's way too vast. Um, and just, just an, an aside, other star systems, we also can't really understand those unless it's through our sun. So there's like a, um, a breaking down of information through the planetary bodies and our sun that allows us to actually understand it because it gives us the codes and makes it relatable for us because we've incarnated into this deep, 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 deep density that's within our solar system. So there's always going to be, you know, planets that are like, I'll just use our earth for example. So we have Mars and Venus. These are the most relative planets to us and also Mercury. Um, these are really containing all of the timelines that also play into higher spheres, but this is the most close to our time and the most relevant to our time. And so what will happen is we will have life waves that evolve our Earth through mixing with Venus and mixing with Mars. So we'll have, we'll have souls that will come from Mars, souls that will come from Venus to the Earth. Um, and this is often what creates the evolutionary impulse is we get these, is we basically attend these different planetary schools and then we come to the earth to consolidate all of that knowledge and all of that wisdom. And so you could say that the higher worlds or the outer spheres, if you will, if you wanna use the old occult language, the outer spheres, um, the outer spheres actually overlap with our earth at certain times. And there is a transmission of beings of other human beings. And now these planets are in a little bit of a higher uh, dimension, higher, higher world a little bit, but we're always overlapping with them. And so this is where we get the timeline overlapping when people talk about Mars or Venus um, and sometimes different stars. 
it's that part of the solar system school that we're in is that higher worlds do overlap with the earth for an evolutionary purpose. Okay, does this make sense? And, and um, when you get to where we are, which is in the 3D plane, because it's a consolidation plane, we are literally surrounded with so many divergent timelines of mankind that are trapped in the lower planes because they've taken a divergent path and they're not sure how to get out of it. And then we're also surrounded by various different thought forms and different things. Um, so it's really chaotic surrounding the earth. There's a lot of stuff going on, um, but there's also very high initiates and adepts that are evolving out of this plane that also come in through certain planetary spheres. Now, this is usually through um, around the time of Lemuria, it was through Venus. Um, and that's usually the, the planetary school that is a solar school um, for our for our planetary system. Venus is this is the has been the, the, the body that is basically translating the sun. And so there's a relationship between the Earth and Venus and Mars, even Mercury and the Sun, that is creating an evolutionary impulse for mankind by these spheres overlapping at different times, um, connecting different timelines, connecting in, in, in their life waves at different times. And this is where we get a lot of the interdimensional beings and aliens and things like that. Um, so it's not just a closed system. The earth is not a closed system. We, it, it, it is interacting with the outer spheres to create evolution. And you could see it as interacting with past or future aspects of ourself, if you will. Once we get into the multidimensional nature of the cosmos, it can really be very mind bending. So, um, I hope this is making sense. So our earth is part of a continuum of life in the solar system. It is exposed to timelines that represent the higher evolutionary path from higher outer spheres that represent the school or the classroom or the level of adepts that are beyond where we are. They've passed the initiation that we face. We overlap with that sphere, which is just traditionally Venus. And then we also overlap with sort of fallen versions of humanity, which is represented in Mars and also sometimes a fallen version of Venus, okay? Because even in the higher planes, even in the higher worlds, they are still evolving, right? And worlds are still being created and splitting and we're getting that energy down here and we're living amongst that. So it's really like a harmony that we're living in. So the whole goal for us in a practical sense is that each one of us on the planet Earth is going to be exposed to all of these different impulses from the cosmos, all of these different evolutionary potentials, all these different timelines, these different cosmic histories, versions of our past on the planet, futures. There's really only two. There's really only a progressive evolutionary path and a regressive, really. But that regressive chain has a lot of different um, branches. It's really about density as well. The lower you go in, in density, the more divergence there is. And then the higher you go in dimension, the less it is until it's just one column, one path. But if we wanna, if we wanna really reach that higher level of consciousness, that higher initiatory path, we have to hang on to that one pure level. If that makes sense. Does, does that make sense? Okay. So in order to take in this information, we're really being asked to evolve out of past habits. We often feel that higher dimensions are chaotic and too immense and too vast for us to understand. However, in reality, every being we encounter is within a specific time impulse. They're, they're, they're not chaotic at all. Because they exist, we can trace them to a specific timeline, a specific evolutionary impulse 
and a specific relationship with the earth and a specific relationship to you. So it doesn't have to be chaotic. It doesn't have to be intimidating. And we don't have to just think that because a being has greater technology than us, that it's farther along in evolution than us. Because there's a, there, if you look at the divergent path of humanity, they just develop technologically and let their soul and their emotion and their heart die at the die on the vine. And so they have incredible technology. They have technologies, this divergent path of humanity. They have technologies where they can like beam thoughts in your head. And a lot of people think that it's telepathic communication. They have technologies where they can dematerialize and materialize and time travel. But every time they use those kinds of technologies, it takes a piece of them. It takes a piece of their soul essence. It destroys them. Because they're not the highest form of those things. Because to really start to play in that arena, you have to be coming from a much different consciousness. And that is what eventually the divergent timeline of mankind learns. But because we have not learned this yet, we are still exposed to that divergent timeline of humanity. But we can trade, but we can learn to discern exactly what that is. It's not a mystery. It does not have to be some great mystery. That is a tactic so that we can be told who we are and given a false cosmology a completely false cosmology that does not actually acknowledge the ability to discern at all. We are now leaving behind the kind of mysticism that relies on anecdotal information from a godlike being. And will we will replace that kind of information with a direct working metaphysics of the cosmos a spiritual science. We humanity will grow to be able to do all of this discerning themselves, be able to channel information themselves. Fundamentally, the only difference in the future, should we choose to take this path will be some people will get a certain type of information and other people will get another type of information based on their talents and skills. But everybody fundamentally will be able to tap into their unique gifts and be able to basically discern different types of beings around them, where they're from, and be able to do that equation, the contact protocol, if you will, very quickly eventually. We just have to get ourselves to this point, but it is possible, but we have to understand these concepts to get there. Okay. So here's my last point, and then I'm going to dive into this. I'm going to dive into your questions. Let's see what you guys have for me. Oh, good. It looks like we're, okay, it looks like we're doing good. Okay, lots of questions for me. Good. Okay, so I really want to end on this idea of spiritual materialism. Because when we think of materialism we often think of like oh i just like love to go shopping and just buy all the shoes that i can or you know we think about only tuning into like the material plane and being obsessed with stuff and things but materialism is actually deeper than that and it, it can affect the the consciousness of the individual in a much deeper way the materialistic mindset can affect the human psyche and consciousness to a point where the individual cannot perceive beyond the lower astral plane. So if you fall too much into materialism over many, many, many different lives and you're following that reductionist impulse, what ends up happening is you end up losing or, or turning off some of your higher spiritual circuitry. So we all talk about how we have to develop our intuition, how we have to get this stuff back because we've been so entrenched in materialism to such an intense degree that we have kind of shut down those higher abilities. We have to get them back. So we have to acknowledge that 
the world that we live in promotes intense materialism, reductionism. And you can still psychically develop from that mindset, but it's really like a slow building back of higher capacities. And so sometimes for the first little while, we're really only tuning into the lower astral plane and a lot of people um, can be only tuning into the lower astral plane and thinking that they're tuning in a lot higher. And what ends up happening is, is that because their whole being is so heavy and so materialized that there isn't even a realization or a memory of what the genuine higher planes are, how it feels in the body. And so unfortunately where we are, people can look at the lower astral plane and think that that is an entire cosmos because we've fallen so intensely into matter that we don't realize that we don't remember how those higher planes feel. We don't remember the structure of the cosmos. We don't, re we don't know that there's anything higher and the lower astral plane creates these strata that seem like they're different dimensions or different densities. And so there's a whole false cosmos um, that a lot of, it's very easy to think that that's the entire cosmos, but it's really just the lower astral plane. And this is because of intense spiritual materialism. So materialism spiritually is when you're only able to perceive the absolute lowest plane. And that plane is completely chaotic. You're taking that to be a higher plane than it is. Okay, does that make sense? And when we have this, another thing that happens when we are functioning from a place of spiritual materialism isn't just that we believe that the lower astral plane is the total cosmos. And the lower astral plane, by the way, is huge. It's massive. And it has different gradients to it as it gets higher and higher and higher, you know, and lighter and lighter and lighter. It can look like a, a, an, an entire cosmic system. So the biggest mistake that we make in, in when we're doing this beyond the thinking that the whole lower astral planes is the cosmos um, is that we think that all interdimensional beings, all aliens are fundamentally different from ourselves. We see a great alien. We think that that being is from Zeta Reticuli. We think that it has no connection to ourselves at all. Meanwhile, they're harvesting our genetics and hybridizing them with us. And how can they have nothing to do with us and be from a completely different star system? And if it's a, if it's a different star system, it's circled around a different type of light and a different body template entirely. You wouldn't be able to necessarily merge with it. So the, so the other thing that we do is we think that every single interdimensional being that we see is different than us. There's no connection to humanity at all, that they're totally different. And when we do that, we don't go and start to ask the right questions to figure out why they're here and how they're related to us, why they're visiting us. Usually the answers are like, oh, they're just studying or they're just this or that or whatever, and it's this and that. But um, we're not understanding that in order for them to even be able to perceive us, there has to be some of us in them. They have to be connected to the earth somehow. And it's understanding this that allows us to truly, uh, to truly function interdimensionally because all of our cosmic understanding, even in the highest levels of cities, which is actually being able to walk through stargates without a ship, being able to walk through a stargate, being able to bi-locate into, in, into different times and things like that. The highest level of that comes from completely knowing thyself, complete inward understanding and knowledge, which translates to completely understanding your inner cosmos, which means you understand what every single being represents to you and to the earth and what timeline they're connected to. That's what that means. So we're really on the precipice of potentially being introduced to a false cosmos that is really only the lower astral plane and 
thinking that every being is fundamentally different than us. The only thing we have in common is that we're just under one great God. And that is not going to allow us to develop because it's a complete externalization and materialization of something much deeper, much more interconnected and much more inter much more intricate. And the only way we can really do that is if we understand that truly, truly, truly everything that is going on outside of us, we understand through relating it to our template not just ourselves, but to our planet and all the evolutionary paths that stem from it. So if a being appears, it's because we share the human earth template at some time. The template may be very damaged. It may be very mutated. It may be practically unrecognizable to you, but if you are seeing it, there is something in common, okay? The template may be very advanced, it may be a master, it may be an adept, but if you are seeing it, it is connected to us. It is that externalization, the making of them the other, that is dangerous. Because in that otherness, not understanding exactly what the connection is, they can become gods, they can become demons, they can become whatever a psychic tells you they are. They can become whatever the government or the CIA tells you they are. Because we don't have the ability to do these equations and say, what is the evolutionary path here from? What is the timeline? I, if I can see you, I know you have a human template in you somewhere. This is the process that we need to begin to develop and open our cosmic consciousness. They're not other. No being that you see is an other. Connected only by because we live in the cosmos. No, there's a connection there. What is it? They are us. But from when? And how do they get that way? And that is where we find our lesson. That is what cosmic consciousness is. And that is how we know our humanity. By seeing these different grades of what we are to become. And because this, this whole cosmos that we see is based on our solar system school, we can do that. Because all of these timelines, all of these evolutionary paths are following the sun, the governing body for us, which is why every single great avatar in every religion or, or in the earlier days worshipped the sun, the logos, the defining force that, that, that contains the complete template of what we are. So there is a governing force. There is a law to this system. We just have to learn it. And psychic materialism is the most shallow form of psychic perception. And it uses impulses and recycles impulses that are mainly just 3D. And once, if you, if you anchor too much in the material world, and you can't open enough, if you can't get that balance right, you're always going to be tuning into a rotting source, if you will. And that's where that regression comes from. So you have to be able to get that balance right. You can't be too deep in, in matter, okay? So... Basically, just the ability to see a being, but no ability to really read its essence, its timeline, its evolutionary path. This is really fundamentally due to us not knowing ourselves. I think also not knowing we can do it, but then when it really comes down to it, if we keep doing this, the reason why we can't sense it within another being is because we can't sense it within ourselves. And shallow self-development means shallow psychic perception. So when we don't have that self-development and we're not going in when we're not healing and transforming our, 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 lower, our lower matter into higher, when we're not going through that spiritual enlightenment process, we get a shallow perception of reality that's just the 3D and 4D world only. And we will think that we're, that we're seeing these greater things and we think that it's 
but in in reality we are it is just um projecting and so the way that we really learn how to see what a being is and who they are and their level of development is to obviously have that level within us developed as well so here's the final point of this lecture today and then i'm going to dive into your questions and we'll have lots of time because i finished a little early today final point the intense exploration that we crave is not the external cosmos being full of ET life that leads us to a larger understanding. So part of, I think sometimes when we approach the cosmos, we think that we're gonna get this exhilaration and self-discovery and human discovery and knowledge from meeting every, from thinking that we're gonna meet all these beings from the outside material world. And we're going to see all these different planets and that's going to suddenly tell us who we are just meeting all these different physical forms and seeing all these planets that's going to be exciting and we're going to grow from that and that's going to tell us who we are it's going to give us a larger understanding finally that big spiritual knowing is going to come from us just physically exploring our cosmos seeing the diversity within it it's not true. It is the lie of the materialist age. What really makes us feel exhilarated as though we're coming together, as though we're learning, as though we understand is the internal exploration that we do. It is going into our inner cosmos, which lights up a template within us that allows us to perceive the outside cosmos in a certain way. Much of the cosmos from where we are now, the physical cosmos is dead. There's various different levels of life. Many of the beings that are regressive are basically making bases inside dead planetary bodies because they are on a dead evolutionary timeline. Higher beings come from a different time in which the cosmos is very much alive where they are. And as we move up higher and higher and higher in dimension and density, the cosmos begins to actually come alive and we live in a more interconnected intergalactic way. That is part of the future. That Star Trek idea is from a much more advanced form of humanity than where we are today. But the regressive timeline tries to create that for us and tell us that we're moving into it now. This is that illusion. It's a complete materialist illusion, okay? We have to know the level of initiation that we are in right now. And the whole point of a regressive or divergent evolutionary path starting is that you don't under we don't understand where we are in time and space. We don't understand what the lesson is. We don't understand what we're supposed to do, so we, 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 we fall into the wrong impulse. So... When we develop inwardly through spiritual development, through meditation, through all of the beautiful teachings that have been left by the avatars that have come and the adepts that are here today and all of that, we begin to light up our cosmic consciousness, our template. And then we get access to seeing the cosmos and understanding it, but it starts within. And right now we're seeing and being introduced to the idea of a completely externalized cosmos with no understanding of how inner, inner development changes it. And this is the beginning of the, of, of, of the last phase of the divergent path of mankind. When we materialize our own inner cosmos, our own inner world so much that we think it all exists outside. And we don't bother to ask, what is that planetary body in here? What is the moon in here? What is that being that I see in here?
that is when we begin to understand the cosmos. So we can ask, what is that in here? And then we begin to open up a system of psychic power, human power, that we have forgotten that we have. Everything that I have told you today about discernment and knowing what beings are and timelines are, that is all within you. Within you is the ability to automatically do a, a calculation about what that being is based on what you are. That is something that exists within every living being. It's a capacity that we have because at one point we were all one. So we know what we are and we know what time is because we're in it. You know what it is. We just have to acknowledge it and begin to use that ability that we can have to calculate timelines, to observe beings and, and calculate their evolutionary path. It's all within us because once we leave our mortal coil and we go into these higher spheres ourselves, we follow the same paths that surround us. So we know because they're part of us. It's just making it more immediate to our knowledge. Okay. So when we begin to open up, we begin to have our memories and our other lives and higher worlds open to us. We, we, we begin to remember that the solar system is a school, that the cosmos is a school and that there's a specific path of cosmic initiation that we move up in, in, in dimension, our body becomes lighter and lighter. It's the ascension path, if you will, is a specific cosmic path. Okay. We remember this. We know this. Okay. Um, we, we begin to, our exact journey through this cosmic school, we begin to remember and uh, the wisdom we have within ourselves that is forgotten comes forward. And that is what we really crave. Whenever anybody wants to go and terraform a world or force themselves on a planet or, 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 or do something external, we, we're really craving something internal. And we have, to, we have to know that. Because we don't want to leave ourselves behind. We don't want to leave ourselves undeveloped and, and miss this initiation. Okay. So what we crave is that inner remembrance, that inner development of our cosmos, our memories of Venus, our memories of Mars. You know, what parts of our soul essence is still on Mars, which is a school, if you will, a, 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 a timeline in itself. What aspect of ourselves is, is connected to Venus? You know, that is what we crave. When people want to, you know, have everything external, we forget that what we're craving is really that internal development. And we project those discoveries outward onto the cosmos. When in reality, it's that discovery is inside of us all along. And I'm going to end it with a little phrase from Dorothy. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. I'm going to get to your questions now. <laughs>